three minutes past eight. A warm welcome to LBC. Um, it's lovely to have an army of researchers out there um, because do you remember that interview I did a moment ago with the chief executive of the Electoral Reform Society when he said virtually no MPs were elected in 2017 with more than 50% of the vote? Well, Gary in Swindon has totted them up. 396 MPs were elected with a majority of more than 50%. The highest was a vote share of 85.7%, the smallest 29.2%. So, um, sorry, Dave, you were talking out of your whatever. Um, anyway, that's a strange way to introduce her now, but I thought we'd better get that on the record. Um, welcome to Dr. Sarah Wollaston. It's a long time since I've seen you. In fact, I didn't, I'm not sure I've spoken to you since you switched parties. Um, now, before we start, we're going to have half an hour of me and then half an hour of you. So if you'd like to ask Sarah a question after half past eight, you can book your call now, 0345 6060 And of course, as usual, we're streaming this live on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, our Facebook page, YouTube page and Twitter to feed. So, what's it like to be a Liberal Democrat? Because I don't imagine you'd ever really countenance that um, until you did it. It's fantastic. It's like a breath of fresh air for me. I, I find that I'm surrounded with people I agree with, rather than surrounded with people I'm trying to persuade to move in another direction. And I think that's the case across our political parties now, In is that um, whereas they both used to be broad churches, increasingly they've they've moved to their fringes and so those who are in the cent moderate centre ground of each of our main parties find themselves increasingly sort of politically homeless um, and for me actually the Liberal Democrats are now that, that pragmatic, moderate and progressive centre ground that we've been missing. See a lot of people when they hear you say moderate they'll say oh but what about revoking Article 50, that's mm. moderate, that's, that's the other side's equivalent of Nigel Farage. Well, I think it's important to say that at this stage, obviously, we're not going to overturn and go from 20 MPs to nearly 350. Had we well, done well, that, there well, would be a massive But earthquake. all the literature I've had from the Liberal mm. Democrats through my letterbox tell me that Jo Swinson's going to be Prime Minister. But she had to start the campaign. You know, she was. When you start a campaign, you have to be optimistic and say, this is what we would do should we have this massive earthquake. Because uh, it would have been really a seismic change. It really would, yes. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to set out that if you were going to have that kind of scale of seismic change, this is what you would do. Because all parties set out in their manifestos what their position would be. But we're also realists. And we've also always been clear that we would continue to back a people's vote if we weren't in that position. Do, and we'd campaign for Remain, unlike the Labour Party, where really nobody knows what they'd campaign for. Do you for. accept, though, that in retrospect that was a tactical mm. error? Because Vince Cable seems mm. to. I think that, as I say, to start the campaign, to set out that should there be a seismic change, you would do that with a manifesto commitment, I think was reasonable. But it, you're right, it hasn't gone down well. And I think during election campaigns, I think all parties take stock of how people are feeling about their programme. And, and so now we've, we've, we're not talking about that anymore. We're being realistic and we're saying we know we're not going to be the, the, the main political party, but we are in a position to be able to significantly influence what happens next. And we would like to see a people's vote with an option to remain, and we're unequivocal that we would be campaigning for remain. Well, we'll, we'll come on to that in, in a moment, but um, how do you account for the fact that the Liberal Democrats have not only made no breakthrough in this election in the polls, they've actually gone backwards in the polls, and a lot of people are predicting that you're actually going to have fewer seats on mm -hmm. December the 12th than you have now? Well, I think that obviously would be very disappointing. I, I, I think that as we get towards polling day, I think a lot of people will look at Boris Johnson and say, they do not want him to have a landslide. That's what I hear repeatedly when I'm out and about. People are very worried about the direction of travel. And therefore, people are starting to say, well, if I don't want um, a Johnson majority, where will I go? And I think tactical voting will play a role in this election like never before. Jo Swinson's had a pretty awful campaign, hasn't she? I think there has been some really gendered unpleasantness about her, which I think has been quite shocking. In what, in what way? Well, imagine if somebody described um, a male politician as shrill. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that you get. It's oh, almost. On. No, I'm come sorry. On. I think there has been. I mean, think of the things that are said about Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn mm -hmm. in this campaign. Nothing that has been said about Joe Swinson could compare to what those two have had to put up with. Sure, there's been, um, you know, criticism of their policies. But what there hasn't been in the same way is criticism of how they look, how they dress, how they sound. Really? Really? Not come in on. the same way. For I mean, 
well, you th- look what happened to Boris, Boris Johnson. Johnson looks a complete mm. shambles most I know, of the time. What- Jeremy Corbyn can't put his glasses on straight. People point these things out. That goes with the territory, whether you're yes. a female leader or a male leader. Mm. But people seem to to find it uncomfortable having a younger woman in politics. Do they? In this way. Yeah, they, I think that some I of this has been a single caller who said mm. that. But it, it, you know, I, I think some of the criticism has been quite gendered, in my view. And I think if you look at, say, Boris Johnson when he went to the cenotaph, you know, he is carrying the wreath upside down. He's looking a mess, and the BBC run footage of him from a previous that year. That was a cock up. Well, I mean, it's oh, a bit of a major cock up. Well, it was a I mean, major you, cock up. You know how these things work. Yeah, I, they don't usually then go back and use footage from a year ago. They've usually got you their seriously footage. Seriously, think that they, they did that deliberately? It seems a very odd thing to have happened. Does it? Does it not to you? Well, not not really, in the sense mm. that you kind of know you, you may have a junior researcher who's sort of typed into the screen Boris Johnson's cenotaph, and the mm. thing comes up. You don't check the date, and out it goes. Now, it shouldn't happen. You're absolutely but why right. Why would you have that footage? there even anyway i i, I agree with you in, in most cases it's cock up rather than conspiracy mm. well, but we can, we, uh, can, we can agree on on, on that mm. um when when i said that you were coming on this afternoon um and you probably saw a lot of these tweets a lot of people said well for goodness sake ask her about her flip-flopping because mm. you started off in the referendum campaign supporting vote leave i think you're actually part of the vote leave no campaign. i never did I, mean, I never joined them i always refused because of the 350 million figure so there's you'll, you'll not find any photographs of me on a platform with them i always refused to sign up because well, I was told that you actually wanted to be part of on the committee no, of it. Absolutely not. No? I always said I wouldn't join, um, and it, because of the three hundred and fifty million a week claim, but, but which was clearly false. So you're right. I did start as what you might call a soft leave Eurosceptic, but I sat on the Health and Social Care Select Committee, chairing that committee, week in, week out, hearing extraordinarily consistent and compelling evidence that any version of Brexit would be harmful for the NHS, for social care, for public health and for research. And I got to the point in when I could not, in all credibility, recommend to people that this would be a positive way forward. And you, and and you hadn't difficult. looked at that before, because I mean, it wasn't a surprise that the referendum was coming. You had quite mm. a long time to prepare for that. But what you, what you have to do, I think in all cases, is be prepared if you look at the evidence in detail and you hear that evidence. I mean, as a clinician, would it have been better for me? Because lots of people said to me, oh, well, why don't you just carry on, Sarah? Don't tell anyone you're going to put a cross in another box. People said to me, it'll be very bad for you politically to change your mind. But you know what? I can't help thinking there's one thing worse than a politician that changes their mind is a politician that doesn't. And I think if you look at the evidence and you believe absolutely that you've got it wrong, you should be prepared to say to people... Do you know what? I am not going to recommend that people vote to leave because I've seen the evidence that makes me feel I've changed my mind. And You know, Ian, I'm not the only person that during the course of the campaign came to a different conclusion. And let's face it, since then, if you look at the number of times Boris Johnson and others have changed their positions, I mean, it's extraordinary that you that you have somebody like Boris, for example, going to the DUP, telling them he's never going to put a board down the Irish Sea two weeks later. What do we get? So, so I think that there are many, many politicians. I can't think that have of another positions. politician though that has changed their mind on the European referendum and changed political parties. I mean, there have been quite well, a few that, that have changed though, political parties, but no, I think that's entirely consistent because well, it's consistent flip floppery. No, yes. it's not consistent flip floppery. What it is, it's a consistent um, a trail of actually following the evidence. And I said that if the Conservatives got to a position where they were seriously going to leave with no deal, because I felt that was so serious, I'd I'd said for some time that that for me would be the final straw. There were many other reasons to leave. I I felt that, and I, I put this all in the letter that I wrote to the Prime Minister at the time, it was also about the failure to tackle burning injustices. There were so many issues where I could see the Conservative Party shifting relentlessly to the right and completely in the grip of the ERG, as I saw it. I know some people may disagree with me, but that was how I felt. And so but you didn't even time, give Boris Johnson a chance to get a deal, which he then got, which, OK, surprised a lot but of I, people. I left when Theresa May was, so it wasn't, it was before Boris Johnson came in. So I, I left in February 
And was since it really Boris, February? Go yes, that's right. Long time ago. Yeah, February the 20th, because I was I'm, grandmother I'm, I'm, on the same day. <laughs> really? Exciting. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, um, the, but, the, but the point is that you, you find when you're in that, because both of our main parties used to be sort of, if you like, internal coalitions. And for people like me in the centre ground of that party, you just get to the point where the elastic can't stretch any further, that you're trying to say, well, let's bring policies back into the centre ground. And you feel in the end that that you, you're just not changing or influencing anything. And so you you're it, it's so out of step. And I would argue that the Conservative Party I joined in 2009 was much more of that broad church. And if you like, the Conservative Party really did move very significantly. It's unrecognisable from the party I joined. Um, and so I felt it was no longer possible in all conscience for me to stay. So I don't think that's inconsistent with also changing my position uh, during the referendum campaign. So as I say, I did vote to remain. I told people why I'd voted to remain. And I also said that if the Conservative Party were going to do no deal, that for me would mean I could no longer remain within it. But there's a third thing that you changed mm -hmm. your mind upon as well. Mm -hmm. And that is that in 2011, you were a leading signatory of a motion to say that anybody that defected to another party had to cause a, a by-election. And you didn't do that. And a, well, a lot of people mm -hmm. have been in touch saying, well, for goodness sake, push her on this. I because will do. we, we okay. don't understand how mm -hmm. she can look herself in it's, the mirror over it's this. It's been, I think, seriously misrepresented. Ten-minute rule bills are not actually bills at all. They're debates. They're ten-minute debates in Parliament and you need ten signatures on them. And very often MPs will sign to allow their colleagues to take a debate forward. So you signed a motion that you no didn't bill. agree with? No, but it, the point is it's about Come a debate. On. Ian, it's about a debate and it happens all the time. Look at all the people who signed the motion for Jeremy Corbyn to have a run at being Prime Minister who that, subsequently said they didn't support different. him. I have to say, it wasn't a bill, in, in being involved in politics yeah. for 30 years, I've never heard of an MP put their name to a bill, whether it's a 10-minute rule bill, an early day it's motion not a or bill. whatever. It's well, not it's a called bill. a bill. I know it's called a bill, but it's a debate. A yeah, ten-minute rule bill. Uh, right, well, I've never heard of somebody misnomer. put their name to a motion that mm. they actually fundamentally disagree with. I think that's uh, no, that's, bizarre. It's, they, they do for debates. So for debates, um, as I say, this was not a bill. There was never a bill published. But they're often voted on. No, but these are. This is something called, uh, as I say, they're called bills, but they're debates. So if there, there had been a vote on motion. that ten-minute rule motion, how would you have voted on it? I mean. <laughs> To be honest with you, Ian, I, you know, these things are just a, a 10 minute opportunity for people to put a point of view in Parliament. That's all they are. They are. They happen several times a week and you will see MPs stand up. Sometimes they are followed by legislation that's published. But I, I think it's completely right. And I did say to everyone that I thought it was fine that people they should then have a chance to have their say on me. And that's why once no deal had been taken off the table, I did vote against my own party's line to have a general election because I agree it's reasonable for people to have a final say on me. Once I had joined the Liberal Democrats, an established political party, I said I would vote for a general election and that's what I did. What, what has been the reaction of uh, people in your constituency to all of this over the last it's, few months? I mean, obviously it's, it's interesting. A lot of people have been ecstatically happy about it and very, very pleased that I left the Conservative Party. But there are others, of course, as you would expect, who feel very strongly and I have, you know, had people come up to me and call me by parts of my anatomy and that I'm a Seriously, traitor. Seriously, they, they actually say it to your face. I have, I have had people be um, very challenging to me personally about it, as, as of course, you know, people, uh, politics is very fraught at the moment and very divisive and I think that's a great shame. There's a long tradition in our politics of people crossing the floor. In fact, I mean, I'm not comparing myself with him, of course I'm not, but Churchill crossed the floor twice, for example. I mean, this is something that we've long had. And I think to describe people as a traitor and in the way that some people have done, I think is wrong because I think there has to be within our politics the ability for people to, on a matter of conscience, say, I can no longer remain where I am. I couldn't have stayed a Conservative and I'm much... I, I personally, I'm completely comfortable with having made that change. It will 
and it may cost me my political career. But as I say to people, I'd rather vote in a way or, and behave in a way that means that I'm out of a job than vote in a way that puts my constituents out of a job. And that's how I feel. That's how strongly I feel about and how profoundly damaging this will be. And I mean, today I've been this morning in, in one of the most disadvantaged parts of my constituency. And there are people who um, who I speak to who who themselves are going to be the most affected by Brexit, who have been led to believe that it's going to make their lives much better. And I, I genuinely think a lot of people are going to be very, very disappointed with how a hard Brexit, because in a year's time... We haven't got a hard Brexit. He's we got will a deal. Have. He hasn't got a yes, deal. He has. He's, he's got, got a, a withdrawal no, agreement. he's got a withdrawal yeah. agreement. That's different from a deal. Well, and so you're, tra- you're changing the territory here because it was, it was always about the withdrawal agreement and then the free trade agreement they, talks would come tied, after that. But they are tied in. So what he has said is that if by the end of 2020 he hasn't negotiated a deal with our our European um, partners, then he will leave with no deal. Now, the difference is that... That's not leaving with no deal. We'll have already left by then. It means we won't have a free trade agreement at at that point. But there will be no no deal. But the the point is that... No, you're mixing up your deals, I'm afraid. I'm not, because the thing is that your trade agreement... Okay, well, let's refer to the other as a trade agreement. um, That requires not just a single negotiating partner. It has to have the agreement of all 27, and in some cases, their regions. And and the reason that the Canada deal was held up so long, as I understand it, was that Wallonia, a region was refusing to sign up. But Canada so, was starting from scratch. We're not. We have complete convergence at the yes, moment. So that ought to not take seven years uh, to but do. I, the reason it will is in, in my area, and I know we're not referring to constituencies on this programme, but the, the, mine is a coastal fishing constituency. And, I mean, the fishing industry is around, well, less than a fifth of 1% of our economy. Is there any possibility that they won't be sold down the river in well, order like to get a deal? Like they were in 1973 yes, with the common fisheries down, policy. They'll be sold down the river again. And they've been how led much, to how believe... How much bigger was the fishing industry in your constituency in 1973? I would say by a factor of probably 100, if not more. But whatever had happened, we would need to have had something which was around mm, maximum sustainable yields. And um, the the point is that... Yes, a lot of these quotas were very unfairly divvied Mm. up at the start. Some of them have been further sold on since then. But the fishing industry have been led to believe that they will be able to have all of the fish and access... I think the chances but, are they'll they'll find that they're traded away what, and they'll what, be bitterly what part disappointed. What doesn't think that it is a good idea for the United Kingdom government to have control over its own fisheries policy? I would love that if they could have all those fish and trade them. So if you take something like mussel fisheries, 50% of them go to France. And if there's no deal, I mean, a few days from the point at which we were about to crash out with no deal... Muscle fishermen in my constituency were being told they'd have to give five days' notice for veterinary checks on every consignment. They'd have to have special these, these paperwork. These threats are always do, made in advance, but very rarely ever carried out. But if there's not access to our waters, um, what we will find is our fishermen won't have access to their markets. And, and we export most of what we catch in this country, and we import most of what we eat. And it is a very complex um, it, arrangement that we have in the sense that making all these promises to people that they would have full access to markets and be able to have full control over our waters, there was never any proper discussion of the trade-offs that will inevitably happen. And I, I think that... But there will be trade-offs, you're right. But I think they'll be sold down the river and bitterly well, you disappointed. you think that, you don't know that. Well, look what happened to the I mean, DUP. I don't see how they yeah, could be more disappointed the than they were by the effect of the common fisheries but policy. But that was in the 1970s. No, it's, no, um, it's continued up now. to now. It's I know, continued but, up but to the now. point is that, that where we are now is that they will find, just like the DUP found, that they'll put their trust in Mr Johnson and they'll be traded away, just as the DUP were. And I think that there'll be huge disappointment for very many people across this country when the, when the sort of Brexit reality unfolds as opposed to the Brexit fantasy. Um, we, we've got to touch on the fiasco mm. that was the independent group for Change or Change mm. UK or what, whatever. Um, what was the point of all of that? Why didn't I you, do, why didn't you join a, the Lib Dems straight away? Because 
there was a sense in which a lot of people felt there should be a realignment of politics in the centre ground. And so the idea was that you had a group that people could join from either party. But that we were hoping that very many more Labour MPs would come with us. But Tom Watson, I think, assured them that he was going to go down a different route. He's now subsequently left. So I think that that initial um, momentum and movement for a realignment stalled. It did. And, and therefore, you come to that point where you say, actually, we need to coalesce into a single party. So yes, in retrospect, with the benefit of hindsight, I would have preferred to have gone straight to the Liberal Democrats. But I think at the time, because it's always easy to look at things from the perspective of now, but at the time, it didn't look as if m people would be comfortable moving to a single established centre ground party. They wanted to have a different grouping, but it would—it was part of a kind of sense I, in which they would then coalesce at some point. I, I would submit to you that, mm. that one of the reasons that you didn't join the Liberal Democrats straight away was because you're actually quite uncomfortable with quite a few Liberal Democrat policies. No, not really at all. I mean, um, I'm trying to think which ones. Legalising cannabis. Be you agree with that? Well, if you've seen my select committee report that we've just published... I uh, haven't, I'm afraid. No, well, um, well, the select committee looked at um, drugs policy and, Ian, 2,600 people, more than 2,600 people died last year as a result of uh, drugs and, and double that if you consider other causes of mortality directly associated with them. And it's... Each one of those deaths should be considered as avoidable. And it's because of the way that we are not taking a harm reduction approach to drugs, which we should be doing. We should be looking at the example of countries like Portugal, where changing to that um, public health approach to drugs policy not only helps the individuals themselves, but it helps their wider communities. Because nearly half of acquisitive crime is directly linked to people using cocaine and heroin and so forth. And so you can look at examples around the world where changes of policy have, have saved lives and saved money and, and actually made a huge difference to communities, things like not having so many discarded needles in public parks and so forth. So we looked at this. I think it's a complete political cowardice that we're not prepared to look at the evidence and save lives um, and do this. So, yes... I think it's time to decriminalise personal possession. Uh, when we went to Portugal, they were very clear with us. They've done this, you know, over a decade ago. It saved thousands of lives in Portugal. They are tell were telling us, many of those that we met, that they thought the next stage for them logically would be to move to a regulated, legalised market. And, and I think that the right thing to do now that we've got this emerging evidence coming from Canada and parts of the US is for us to over a period of time, starting with decriminalisation for personal use, a harm reduction approach based on the evidence, is then move progressively towards that just for cannabis. Um, but as I say, we've, we've got the benefit of being able to look at what happens over Canada, in, in Canada mm. over the next few years and base it on that. But as I say, the political cowardice that allows thousands of people to die unnecessarily well, I can shocking. remember 20 years ago when um, a young MP called David Cameron was on the Home Affairs Select Committee and would have said much of what you've just said. Yeah. And then as soon as he got into government, of course, that he, 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 he realised that, well, electorally, that was possibly mm -hmm. not the smartest thing he could I have know. done. But I, I, I think probably like you, I think opinion has probably moved on a little bit um, since then. Um, if you had to make a choice between Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson being Prime Minister after the election. You had to make a choice. Had My life depended on it. My choice. life depended oh, on it. Right. Who would you choose? Well, <laughs> um, well, as I say, that's one of those questions that then immediately You'd gets die, used against you. you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be there for you. Um, I think, to be honest with you, it's such a poor choice. I mean, you're going to choose between somebody... I mean, but, Boris Johnson, but who just lies have, and it? lies and lies. And I, one lady said to me on the doorstep the other day, she said, I know he's a liar and a cheat, but I'm still going to vote for him. And it's just a, it's a consistent pattern. I, I saw it as chair of the committee that was the chairs of all the select committees, which is the only one that could um, have called Boris Johnson... He repeatedly said he was going to come, cancelled at the last minute. And this is just a pattern of behaviour, that he evades scrutiny. 
And he lies casually about things in a way that I think will only get worse if he has a landslide. A lot of people are very worried about that. So, no, I don't trust Boris Johnson. I think it's just going to be a pattern of behaviour that will get worse and we won't like it. So, no, I definitely wouldn't want to see Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. But equally, I think there are some major problems in having Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. And so I think the role of the Liberal Democrats should be that you can moderate some of those policies. So not coalition, because we were very badly stung by that last time. Probably not confidence stung and supply. Stung by you as a Conservative MP, because you were supporting... Well, wait, I saw the way they ended up getting blamed <laughs> for stuff. I mean, and you know, all the good stuff that happened around, for example, environmental policy, were Lib Dem policies, um, and yet they ended up being blamed. That's often the, the, the thing that happens to smaller parties. You get squeezed and blamed from both sides. But I so, don't remember you having any sympathy for them at the time. Mm. Actually, to be honest, I, I've always worked very constructively. In, you know, one of the things for me is I, I've never wanted to go down the government minister route. Um, I've much more enjoyed the scrutiny route in Parliament. So the select committee system, which is a place where um, it's, the, it's the part of Parliament that was actually functioning. Um, it's not the bit where people are yarboo and shouting at each other. We're sitting around in a semicircle having to try and reach agreement and to, to work together in a constructive way. So I've always been comfortable with working in that cross-party collaborative way. And I think that's what the public want to see more of as well. So I was part of a body, for example, that was trying to encourage that approach to social care reform. And so, so yes, that, that's been my role in Parliament. Okay. It's very much the select committee Just route. Just finally, before we um, go mm. to the callers, if you don't win on December the 12th, do you have a plan? Would you go back to medicine? Um, well, I've now been out of practising medicine for nine years, so if I did, I'd have to retrain. But I used to train GPs myself, so I, I suspect I'd find someone who would take it some me thought. on. Um, well, of course, every, every politician should go into every election not thinking that they've got a right or a job for life. So, yes, um, I think I would probably realistically be uh, rather late for me to go back into mainstream medicine. But I think that there is always going to be a need for people who are genuinely interested in scrutiny, asking difficult questions, as you do. Um, I try. <laughs> asking difficult questions, that's what, that's what it should be about. And um, so, you know, that possibly would be one avenue. Okay. But genuinely, I think what I would probably do is enjoy being a grandmother for a few weeks. So... <laughs> Just for a few weeks, though. Mm. Right, we've got lots of questions. If you can't get through now, do keep trying over the course of the next half an hour. Sarah Wollaston here with me until nine o'clock. It's 8.31, news headlines, Lucinda Horsley. The Queen has hosted Donald Trump at a reception for NATO leaders at Buckingham Palace. The US President joined Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson, among other world leaders. He's now at Downing Street, head of a NATO summit tomorrow. It's emerged the London Bridge killer had a police escort when he went to a previous rehabilitation event but didn't have one last week. The family of Usman Khan say they're saddened and shocked by what he did. Armed police have been called to a flat in Coventry after reports of a gun being fired. Staff at bars and restaurants around Broadgate had been told to stay indoors but West Midlands police say no one's been injured and it looks as though the firearm was firing blanks from a window. LBC weather clear spells across the south with a patchy frost and fog developing overnight. Largely dry elsewhere but increasingly wet and windy in the far northwest. A low of two degrees. This is LBC. You or your business accounts? Who's the boss here? Say goodbye to that shoebox full of receipts and hello to simple solutions from Sage. Over a million British businesses already rely on Sage and we can support you to free up your future with smarter bookkeeping that automates repetitive tasks and gives you the insight you need to inform your decisions. Win-win. Find out more at sage.com forward slash automate. Sir, what am I taking on this mission? This gadget is a paperclip that's also a transmitter. Wow. Look, toothpaste that burns through glass. whoop de do. What about these little things? Ah, invisible hearing aids. They fit completely in the ear. Brilliant. How do I put them in? Um, you don't. They're for my ears only. <laughs> invisible hearing aids at transparent prices. From £495 at Specsavers.
Ask in store for details. Some regard me as a national treasure. Well, that's very kind of you, but let me tell you about a hidden national treasure. Cello TVs. Cello are the only British manufacturer of premium quality LED TVs, but without the hefty price tag. 16 to 65 inches, manufactured in the UK, there's a Cello TV for everyone. This Black Friday, get a 65-inch smart 4K TV for under £550. Search Cello.tv. Did you know that bacteria from gum disease may cause Alzheimer's? The GAIN clinical study is testing an investigational drug that may halt the progression of Alzheimer's by reducing damage caused by bacteria that travel to the brain. St Pancras Clinical Research is seeking volunteers aged 55 to 80 with Alzheimer's to participate in the GAIN study. To find out more, please contact St Pancras Clinical Research at stpancrasclinicalresearch.com. That's stpancrasclinicalresearch.com. I'm Jose Mourinho. I know a thing or two about being special. Getting a road named after you in your hometown, special. Winning the little jackpot on Paddy Power Games, not special. Understood, Jose. Yes, someone wins an average £40,000 jackpot every single day. So if you win, don't think you're special. Daily Jackpots by Paddy Power Games. Jackpots must be awarded by 11pm and vary from day to day. Jackpot is shared with other operators available on selected games. T's and C's at paddypower.com, 18plusbgamblerware.org. Ian Dale on LBC. Sarah Wollaston is here with me. You can watch us on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, on the YouTube channel, Facebook page or Twitter feed, and tens of thousands of you do, um, because we're lovely people to look at, frankly, aren't we, Sarah? <laughs> uh, right, let's go to your calls. Um, Mark is in Chichester. Hello, Mark. Hello, Ian. Good evening, Sarah. Hi. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask Sarah, uh, just to be clear about what the Lib Dem policy is on private sector involvement in the NHS. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I chaired an inquiry which worked alongside the NHS, looking at what reforms should happen, um, because... We know that the operation of the sort of automatic tendering of services uh, wastes a lot of money and it ties up a lot of time. And so there definitely need to be changes to the Health and Social Care Act. But what the NHS did was it consulted very widely or engaged very widely um, with the voluntary sector, with, with patient groups, with unions, with staff. And the overwhelming sense was that people didn't want another wholesale top-down reform of the NHS, but they did want to have changes to the way the competition rules work in the NHS. So they came up with a set of proposals, and, and you can look at that. They're called the Recommendations to Parliament um, for, for, for NHS legislation. And they were really sensible, pragmatic set of proposals, which the select committee then subjected to scrutiny. We went backwards and forwards. And those recommendations to Parliament are there. And I think all political parties would do very well to abandon ideological approaches, listen to what the NHS is saying for a time, for a change, and actually scrap some of those competition rules. They've come up with a very sensible set of proposals for how that could be done. And I hope they're just put into law. So I hope that all political parties will just work together and listen to the NHS's proposals rather than listen to ideology. Because I, I think we do need to, to change the automatic tendering of services, which isn't working, and make sure that we have um, the whole of the NHS working in a sensible way. That doesn't mean that you exclude the private sector altogether because there are parts where that may genuinely benefit patients. But let's not, for goodness sake, keep wasting time and energy having to put everything out to tender all the time. Mark? Yeah, I, I get that, Sarah. Uh, I'm just conscious that the vast majority of primary care services are provided by the private sector uh, in the form of GPs who form themselves, if they're not sole traders, into partnerships or they incorporate as limited companies uh, and only GPs and certain other designated NHS professionals are allowed to hold shares in, in limited companies. And then they contract with the NHS with a view of making profit by entering into tendering for, indeed, uh, general medical services contracts. And we had, I think, while Andy Burnham's was health secretary, 
the slightly absurd position where GPs were forming themselves into limited companies so that they could pay themselves uh, by declaring dividends rather than by having uh, emoluments subject to uh, uh, PA. Well, we're, we're delving in, right. into, the, into the depths so The technical here, stuff. I, I so all, just bit. to explain it perhaps uh, to listeners is that right from the outset of the NHS, um, GPs have been independent contractors to the NHS. So that's been a model that's been around right, right from the get-go. And likewise, dentists and pharmacies and opticians, they're, they're all um, part of that. But when people talk about NHS privatisation, generally they're not talking about GPs, they're talking about big companies coming in and taking over whole swathes. And it's particularly been more of an issue in the community sector and, and mental health services, for example. But as I say, for GPs, that that's always been the model right from the outset of the I NHS. Mean, in a sense, this whole argument about public good, private bad has bedeviled yeah. this debate for decades. And until, mm. until we can actually have a rational debate on that, exactly. we're never going to get anywhere, are we? But exactly. maybe an election campaign, it ought to be the time for that. But I, I suspect it's not where actually going to be talking about this in the nine o'clock hour mm. um mark thank you martin is in barnsley hello martin good evening good evening Hi. sarah good evening i'd just like to ask you mm-hmm. when mrs may gave you the chance mm-hmm. to vote on the customs union and the single market could you explain to the listeners why you voted against it please Well, Mrs May was never in favour of going down that Norway-style model anyway because she always said that she didn't think that was properly Brexit. And this is, I think, the fundamental problem with the whole of the referendum campaign is it never really properly set out because there's lots of different versions of Brexit. And if the hardest Brexiteers had actually voted for Mrs May's deal, we'd been out by now. Um, And and the trouble is that I had lots of people in my constituency writing to me saying, please don't vote for the deal. So, you know, it seemed to me that nobody was happy with her particular deal, not even the hard Brexiteers. So that's why I've always felt it was best for us to have a defined deal that you then put back to people and say, is that what you meant by Brexit or would you rather stay in it? And the thing I would say is as a clinician, um, Martin, is that, you know, it's a bit to me like signing a consent form for an operation three years ago without anyone having specified what the operation Martin's was. But question, in the yeah. indicative votes, why did you vote against the single market oh, yeah, so the indicative, union? So, you know, basically because I had always said when, once I, that no version of Brexit was good for the NHS social care research and public health. But I was prepared to accept that if that deal went back to the people as a final say referendum, I'd said I would vote for any of the deals subject to a final say referendum. So that that was my position, Martin, was that I would have been happy. And I said that repeatedly to the Prime Minister, that, you know, I would support her deal subject to that final say. I know a lot of people don't agree with me. I, I realise that. I just I think, think it's odd when you clearly wanted to stay in the single market and the customs union, you voted against doing so. Well, as I say, we would have voted for it subject to it being part of a referendum. And I think that, that you know, it's... It's always one of those things. But you, you, say, but you do, see, the Liberal Democrats split have three ways happy. on those votes, and that's why they're not taken seriously on this issue. Because if, you, if you're going to split three ways, not just two, but three, um, how can you be expected to take, um, the, be the taken The majority seriously? of Liberal Democrats, of course, did always say that they wanted to have a deal subject to a referendum. That's that's always been their consistent position, that they would support it subject to a referendum. So I don't think that's inconsistent. Okay, Martin? Uh it's very hypocritical because Kenneth Clark, the most pro-European Tory I know, threw the audit paper across the House of Commons of you. I consider Mrs May an honourable lady. Mm-hmm. So you would have stayed in the customs union and you should have all got your act together and I can't be bothered to do the maths. I think you'd have stayed in the single market, which is, vi- is virtually the EU. You've got to play by EU rules. So it's EU membership in all by name martin would you it. martin would you have been happy that that was represented brexit if we'd stayed but as a norway no just asking you a question martin if we had voted as the commons to have a norway style brexit where we were in the single market and the customs union would you have felt that was brexit i'd have taken the customs union as brexit 
but I wouldn't have taken the single right. market. So you wouldn't have been happy. So the other way around. And a lot of other people wouldn't have been happy. So my view is that if that, and I, of course that would have been, if I had to pick any one version of Brexit, that would be the one I would have picked. But I still think because it would have made a lot of people very unhappy and you'd have had a lot of people jumping up and down and saying it was a fix and it wasn't Brexit, that it would have been better to put it to the people. So that, that was my consistent position, Martin, is that whatever arrangement that we settled on people should have the final say and and I think that the great pity of the referendum campaign is that it was never set out that it could be a two-stage process that you in fact Jacob Rees-Mogg argued this himself famously in the Commons that that you know you so could I have a two-stage process. I don't remember process. you arguing that when the, when no. the bill was going through Parliament <laughs> to have a referendum I don't remember you standing up and saying. I did actually write saying... a piece about that in my local paper but you're right now I didn't talk a lot in uh, about that as the deal went through but I did say that I thought we should have a final say referendum Okay, Martin thank you let's go to Noel in Gloucester Noel what's your question for Sarah please um, hi how are you doing hi Noel um, yeah um, seeming as the Liberal Democrats were um, um, helped bring an austerity in 2010 you were part of the Conservative Party then and now you're in the opposite party that without supporting the Conservative Party they wouldn't have been able to bring in austerity and so much suffering on the poor of this country. Do you think you've been forgiven for that? I think that the Liberal Democrats ended up getting an, a, an awful lot of criticism for for when when we first went into coalition supporting measures that actually did mean that there were significant cuts to public services. What I feel is that those cuts went on for too long. You voted and for them. I did. And, and that's one of the challenges that you find when you're in a political party is that you can argue for changes. And I mean, for example, there are a number of occasions where I did vote um, against the party line. Uh, I think I was probably a bit of a thorn in the side of some of my colleagues, if uh, <laughs> it's fair to say. They didn't but didn't regard you, you as a team player, did they? No, I think that the point is that, you know, I say I was always to the to the left of my party and always trying to argue for things that I you know but you, you don't win every battle and that's the thing about being in a political party is that you're trying to argue from within but ultimately you get to a point where the elastic can only stretch so far and then you feel you have to leave and that that's the position I was in Noel is that I just felt I couldn't remain in the conservatives because I became increasingly unhappy that I wasn't actually influencing anything, I was just propping them up. Could you ever be tempted back? I mean, no. If they changed in any meaningful way, you don't uh, think... They you, won't. You couldn't do a Churchill and re-rat. They, they, <laughs> will, they will not change. I think the point is that the members... change over time. But the membership has changed, just like the membership of the Labour Party has very significantly changed. I think that's what happened. I mean, certainly I think if you look at the way, for example... There was a concerted Facebook campaign in my constituency to get people to join the party in order to deselect me. Um, and, and I saw the way that that influenced the membership, that there were people joining who, who were actually former UKIP members. And that's why I but described it as they'd probably been former Tories before they went to UKIP. They, well, but the point is that they were much more to the right of the party. So I think the membership of the Conservative Party has shifted very significantly to the right. Um, and because of that, they select MPs who are much more to the right. And so you tend to get this, 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 as I say, within our politics. I think it's a great tragedy that both of our main political parties have, have you know, gone to their, their fringes. And I, I think that's left our politics rather poorer. Okay. Uh, Noel, thank you for that. Um, Ellen in Pimlico is not happy with me. She says, I'm listening to your interview with Sarah Wollaston. I always respected you as an interviewer, but I've never heard you give anyone such an easy ride. Mm. Uh, when she mentioned legalising cannabis, you let her give such a one-sided view without pulling her up when she mentioned the positive effects legalisation has had in Portugal. Even I know that Portugal is now revising its view on the legalisation of drugs. How could you as a well, serious journalist have let her get away with that mistruth? I think you were letting 
getting your good reviews about interviewing go to your head. Ellen, I think I think we're going to have to beg to differ here, Ellen, because um, the people we met in Portugal and we met with uh, a lot of political figures from both sides, as well as a meeting with clinicians and people working with addicts. Um, you know, it's a, it was an extraordinary visit. Uh, the How way, long ago was this? Oh, this was uh, earlier this year. All right, so it's very, and, very recent. Uh, and it, I found That's it, why I didn't pull her up on it, Ellen. Yes. So, in fact, I, I disagree with you, Ellen. In fact, you know, we were, we heard that there was huge support. And as I say, it's it's not full legalisation in Portugal. It's decriminalisation and taking a public health approach. The, the places that have full legalisation, for example, that's Canada has gone down that route and several states in the US. But Portugal, as I say, is decriminalisation okay. and harm reduction. Right, we'll go to a quick break and then we'll take more of your calls to Sarah Wollaston. It's 8.48. James O'Brien, Monday to Friday from 10am. I mean no particular malice when I say this. I discovered some time ago in the aftermath of Brexit that people would rather be lied to than admit a mistake. And I warned you, actually I warned myself, I expressed profound fears that the country was heading to a place where people would actively welcome, not just ignore, but actively welcome being lied to. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. Some regard me as a national treasure. Well, that's very kind of you, but let me tell you about a hidden national treasure. Cello TVs. Cello are the only British manufacturer of premium quality LED TVs, but without the hefty price tag. 16 to 65 inches, manufactured in the UK, there's a cello TV for everyone. This Black Friday, get a 65-inch smart 4K TV for under £550. Search cello.tv. Marooned in deep space and no sign of help. Don't panic. I'm with the AA. The app lets you track the mechanic right to your side. I'm thinking of joining the AA. No, I don't think they accept cats as members. Who said anything about being a member? I want one of those shiny yellow jackets. Ow! There are lots of smart reasons to join the AA. You'll get unlimited call-outs, our tap and track app, and we'll get you going again in around 30 minutes of arrival. Switch to a different kind of breakdown service from just £5 a month. Visit the AA.com. New customers only. T's and C's apply. At Esso, you can earn double nectar points when you spend £5 or more on shop items. Esso Nectar, helping fuel your every day. See esso.co.uk for exclusions. With my new teeth, I feel confident that I can eat absolutely anything I want to eat. French bread, steak. At Darwood and Tanner, we use our expertise in dental implants to change lives. It makes a huge difference in confidence when you can open your mouth and smile and laugh out loud with your mouth open without displaying huge amounts of grey, black or missing teeth. Download your information pack at darwoodandtanner.co.uk today. Your smile is our healthy obsession. Unlimit the tunes you love this Christmas on Vodafone. With Spotify Premium included on our unlimited data plans with entertainment. The future is exciting. Ready? Vodafone. Available on unlimited and unlimited max plan. Maximum download speed applies to unlimited plan. Speed and coverage may vary. Full terms on unlimited and entertainment at vodafone.co.uk slash unlimited. Close your eyes. Can you hear the music? Feel the energy, the joy, the vibes. Open your eyes. That's Castillon. Close your eyes again. You're listening to the sea, the waves. You feel the sand beneath your feet. Feel the freedom. Open your eyes. That's Castillon. Pack your bags and let's go. Now with regular direct flights from London Stansted and Luton to Castillon Airport, you've no excuse. Seize the moment. Memories to live for. Castillon, Spain. Turismo de Castillon.com Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. Sarah Wollaston is with me, Liberal Democrat candidate, former Conservative. Um, are you going to, if you don't win, mm-hmm. what you, what would you, what will you miss most about <laughs> Parliament? Or, or have you just come to the conclusion, actually, you know, it might be a blessed relief? Um, do you know what? I love it. And it, it is challenging, but it's it's the breadth of it and it's so interesting and I think as with being a when I was a GP the thing that that really is very similar to my work as a when I was a GP it was that having constituency surgeries mm. they were remarkably similar except no one took their clothes off I guess and um, uh, I'm sure they it's were... happened <laughs> Um, but that sort of very personal that you, people come in with 
absolutely all sorts of issues and you're trying to reach something where you can genuinely be helpful and then taking those issues forward into parliament and and I, you know I, I and I I loved having a private members bill for example and having a now an act of parliament the stalking protection act um, so there are all sorts of opportunities you have and you, you go from you know one subject to another it's, it's endlessly fascinating and it's that very personal aspect of it and the challenge and there are there are bits I won't miss of course but there there be lots of things that I will desperately miss if I but I hope I hope I'm not out I mean, I'm, I'm, obviously, I think we <laughs> take that as read. Uh, Wes is in Dartmouth. Hello, Wes. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, Dr. Wollaston. Uh, good evening, Wes. Uh, I've just got a couple of quotes from uh, a 2017 hustings you had in Tottenham. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You believe that you would uh, make a huge mistake if you were to promise one thing and end up doing another thing to actually vote against implementing the deal of Brexit and send mm-hmm. us back into Europe. And also you said that the principle is that we respect the outcome of the referendum. Mm -hmm. So your whole campaign is that you say that we shouldn't believe Boris Johnson for his lies and inconsistencies. So why should we believe you on yours? I think because it's about, for me, is wherever you are, look at what the effect will be. So I have to look at people in my constituency in the eye and am I going to say to them that I knowingly and deliberately voted for something that I think would have profound harms for people's health care, for people's social care. I mean, just look at that Operation Yellow Hammer document. All of the things that I think would be profoundly harmful, um, I just couldn't go ahead and knowingly and deliberately vote for them without people having the opportunity to say, on this particular version of Brexit, is that what I really want? Um, As I say, for me, it's, it's about the principle of consent and... And the analogy I use, as I say, is, you know, you go into an operating theatre, the surgeon cannot go ahead unless they've explained exactly what the operation involves, what its risks and its benefits are, and then you sign the consent form. So I I think that at the moment we, we have a consent form that was very vaguely worded and signed over three years ago. And now it's, you know, given that it has such profound constitutional, economic and social consequences... Why are we so afraid of going back to people and saying, this is the actual deal, is this what you meant by Brexit? And if, and I think also it would genuinely bring us together as a country because, I mean, obviously, if people then said, yes, that's what we want to do, that's what we want to proceed with, then I think the whole country comes together and says, well, that is what the majority genuinely want. Okay, Wes? Oh, I believe as a constituent of yours, I believe that what we're seeing at the minute is constant changes of opinion, constant, uh, pretty much lying to the people. As you said yourself that 54% of the Totnes constituency voted to leave. Mm. And I just believe having that constant change of opinion and uh, you painting it to be uh, a pro remain place, I just believe it's. No, I, what, I, no what, what I've said, um, Wes, is that. This constituency is a bit like the rest of the country in that the South Hams part of it voted to remain and the Torbay part of the constituency voted to leave. So it's like many other families where you get people having different points of view. But I've always said that the research from the University of East Anglia said that overall it was a leave constituency. But the bit that you live in actually voted to remain um, and that's that's what I've said is okay. that within the South Hams it voted to remain. Um, let me just remind people who the other candidates yes. are Sorry, in, yeah, in Tottenham. Well it was inevitable <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, John Kitson is an independent, Anthony Mangnall is a Conservative it's very difficult to pronounce that, Louise Webberley is a Labour candidate and of course Sarah Wollaston standing for the Liberal Democrats so let's go to Annie in Carnforth. Hello Annie. Hello Ian Hello Sarah. Hello. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that the Lib Dems are saying that they're the most Remain party. So why did you give Boris Johnson the election he wanted and why are you running in very close, tight, two-way marginal seats where you've got no chance of winning and it's neck and neck between 
the Labour and the Tories, uh, you're going to split the Remain vote, mm. possibly, and then maybe let the Tories in, and then we're going to end up with... Well, well you uh, know, I go there. Annie, can I just ask you, can you name me any seats where the Labour Party has set, stepped down? Um, I mean, we, we were part of uh, an alliance of uh, uh, over 60 seats where the Green Party, the Liberal Democrats and Plaid Cymru came together and under the banner of Unite to Remain agreed not to split the Remain vote. Now Labour were approached by them and declined to take part. Uh, in, in my area, for example, people have st- stopped campaigning in some areas to do that as well. But I'm afraid the Labour Party are not stopping campaigning or standing down anywhere. So I'm afraid it's the, it's the Labour Party that needs to look very carefully, in my view, at how they can behave in a constructive way to take part of this, because certainly other political parties are doing it. It's Labour that's not doing it. OK, quick question from Sam in Tunbridge Wells. Hi, Sam. Hi there, Ian. Uh, good evening, Dr Williston. Hi, Sam. Um, I'd just, I just like to ask you... Oh. It's, uh, you know, you, you're with the Liberal Democrats. Mm-hmm. How is it democratic to um, want to campaign to overturn the democratic result of a referendum? OK. You know, seven, 17.4 million people voted way back in 2016 to, uh, to leave the EU. Mm-hmm. And I, for one, am uh, disgusted... Of Tunbridge Wells. Disgusted of Tunbridge Wells. We, we've, we've met you. Disgusted of Tunbridge Wells. Yeah. Well, you, you, you and me, you and me not... both, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, Sam. Let, let's let's tell you how it is. Um, it, you, you lots of minute. parties put things in their manifestos and then campaign on them. We, we're not going to be the the main political party. Uh, we all know, we all accept that. And therefore, what we always said was that that would only apply if there was some seismic earthquake that we went to having, you know, around 350-odd well, that, that MPs. That kind of missed so, the electorate, So the it? bit that got missed out, because it was always there, it's just it wasn't so newsworthy, is that we would continue to campaign for a people's vote, uh, but people could be sure that unlike the Labour Party, we were absolutely unequivocal that we would be campaigning for Remain. So it was just to make it clear that we're an unequivocally Remain party. Um, Sam, thank you very much indeed, and thank you to Sarah Wollaston. Uh, it's been an enjoyable hour. Um, we will, well, hopefully, see you again in one capacity <laughs> or another. Um, thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you so much and of for course, having if me. You, on. If you would like to listen back to this hour, you can do so on the Cross Question podcast or via the LBC YouTube channel. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be continuing our conversation on the NHS. It's become a real political football in this election. I think the debate on the subject has been absolutely woeful. Let's improve it over the course of the next hour. 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player, and. Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, the Queen has hosted Donald Trump at a reception for NATO leaders at Buckingham Palace this evening. The US President is now at...